Welcome back to the final part of this evening's Crosstalks. We hope your brain still has some room for one more discussion, but if you feel tired or sated with information, it's not at all surprising. Living among hundreds of updates every second on a number of platforms, we humans are bracing against an information flow of unprecedented intensity. Whether you're exposed to manhunts on the cable news, Twitter reports about the latest developments in Syria, or Facebook updates about your best friend's newborn baby's latest diaper change, this reality places new demands on all of us. How and when should we be able to work? And what do we do for rest and recovery? How are our brains coping with the side effects of all this vitally useful communication? Before we start, just a quick reminder that you viewers have the opportunity to ask questions directly on the air. Simply log on to your Skype account and call us on Crosstalks TV and we'll patch you through. Crosstalks is a collaboration between Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology, with us to discuss whether or not our brains are in danger of reaching information overload. Our three very prominent researchers from these two institutions. Please welcome Jeanette Helgren Koteleski, professor at the School of Computer Science and Com Communication, KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. Christine Melner, PhD in Psychology, Stockholm University. Eric Franzen, Professor in Computer Science, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. And Skyping in from New York, I think, is the senior editor at the uh, senior editor at Scientific American and author of the book Who Gives a Gigabyte? A Survival Guide for the Technologically Perplexed. Welcome, Mr. Gary Stix. Thank you. And finally joining us from Seattle is senior investigator at the Allen Institute for Brain Research, Professor Clay Reed. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Jeanette Helgren Koteleski, you're part of the Vast Human Brain Project, uh, where, where you use mathematical modeling to try and understand the neural mechanisms underlying, for example, information processing. How far along are we in understanding how the brain really works? Yeah, so I would say that we do have a lot of data. We have pieces of knowledge. For instance, we have, um, we have um, a lot of information how uh, different neuronal types, their electrical properties. We know how several of these neurons are coupled together, and also both uh, short range and long range. And we know, for instance, protein expression patterns in the brain, and we know how different parts of the brain become active when we do different tasks. And we also know how, how the environment uh, can change our behavior um, in good and bad ways. But uh, uh, and it's sort of di different disciplines that work with, with all these things. Uh, so we have a lot of data. But what we are not so good at is really to bridge between these uh, levels of information. So, for instance, um, if I take an example, uh, we don't know this uh, causal chain of events. For instance, if, if we have a change at the levels of the proteins, how does this change the electrical properties of, of uh, uh, the nerve cells and how these nerve cells, when they change their electrical properties, how, how does that affect signaling in the network where they participate and uh, how does signaling on the network level affect uh, the whole brain and how does that affect behavior? So we don't know this chain of events and also vice versa. We, we, we don't know how the environment change the activities in, in the brain really and we don't know how this uh, change in activity in turn changes uh, cellular properties and proteins expression. So we sort of we don't uh, have this causal change of events and this is really what uh, the Human Brain Project is, is about to try Putting to all integrate this uh, all this kind of information <coughs> using sort of information technology. Very good. Uh, Christine Melner, you recently completed a stress research study on how the so-called boundaryless modern work organizations affect us. Can you tell us a little bit about this work? Uh, we just finished the data collection in four large organizations in Sweden uh, characterized by we, what we call boundaryless work in the sense that uh, through new technology, uh, employees can decide to a large extent for themselves 
when to work during the day, during the week, during the coming year, but also where to perform their work, and also how to perform their work, what to do, who to collaborate with. So there's an increase in freedom and, and flexibility, but this, uh, which is possible through the new technology, but also this places very high demands on people to regulate their own work effort. Uh, and what we see is that it easily becomes that or, um, anywhere, everywhere, easily becomes always on. And that's a problem for a stress, recovery, work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Erik Fransén, one of the things uh, you study in your research is how the brain performs functions like working memory. How is the working memory affected by this endless flow of information uh, that we're exposing ourselves to? Right. So, so working memory is really one of the systems of the brain that we need and use to, uh, to communicate. So I think you know, working memory enables us to filter out the information we want to find in the in the communication, and also it's the system to also may enable us to work online, to have to store information online that is active and important to us. So working memory is really one of the key areas and functions of the brain we need for communication. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it, it's very much a limited resource. Uh, the models really explain why is the capacity of working memory so small. We might think it's, it's uh, much larger than it is. It's usually three or four items we can hold online. And models will explain to us why, in fact, is it so low. And when we store or we'll try to store more, how we become more sensitive to distractions and why we lose things we want to keep in mind. When you said that something is online in the brain, does that mean that, that you're acting, actively thinking about it? Yes, it is, yes. exactly, yeah. So ironically, when you're online on Facebook, let's say, while trying to work, you're probably making it harder to keep the things online in your brain that you need. Exactly, yes. And in fact, when you try to process sensory information like, like speech or visual, like look, looking on a movie, you're going to partly use the same system. So in fact, you're reducing your working memory capacity when you process information. And on the opposite way too, you get less good at processing information when you try to store many things in your working memory. Mm -hmm. Gary Stix, uh, your book, Who Gives a Gigabyte, is a pretty extensive tutorial in modern technology. Now we've already started talking a little bit about technology and stress. To what degree do you think people are also stressed by the technological changes themselves, with just trying to keep up? I think that people get stressed to the extent that they uh, don't understand a technology and they begin to fear it. And I think that the key to uh, dealing with um, technological overload in everyday life is finding out about technologies and then deciding what you don't need. And most of the um, uh, the devices, the uh, social media networks out there are things that you don't need. The, the impediment to that is that it's sometimes hard for some people to go through that process about uh, finding things out. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, my wife uses Facebook all the time. She's on it every day, and I don't actually find that I need it that much. On the other hand, I use Twitter all the time because I'm in the media. My wife doesn't understand Twitter. My 27-year-old um, uh, son, who's in medical school, never uses Twitter. And just because uh, movie stars and politicians use it doesn't mean they have to use it. So you just have to, to come to terms with this overwhelming flood of different things out there that are basically being sold to you and pick what you need from this enormous um, crop of different offerings. Uh, Clay Reed, you've focused your research on how the brain processes and makes sense of visual information. Can you tell us uh, what some of these discoveries are? Sure. Um, I've, <coughs> throughout my career, studied what's known as the early visual system, which consists of the neurons 
in the eye and, and uh, the parts of the brain uh, that the eye sends information to. Um, at that level, uh, a pretty good analogy for what the visual system does is it's a very good and fairly high definition TV camera. The, the amount of information that the eye can send the brain is actually quite extraordinary. It, it's a couple million pixels. It, uh, when presented with a lot of visual information, and I'm talking in a technical sense, visual information in terms of bits per second, the same way you'd measure how much Skype is sending from uh, Seattle to Stockholm, uh, we can process uh, on the order of several million, maybe 10 million bits per second of information. And uh, the, the early parts of the brain, not the parts of the brain that, uh, for instance, are very good at recognizing faces, but the parts of the brain that are uh, involved with very low-level processing of vision, they can take in that information. But what's somewhat astounding is, is that a huge amount of this information that makes the brain extraordinarily active is completely unavailable to our consciousness. You know, we have a good TV uh, camera in our eyes, but we, as we've heard earlier, can only focus on three, four, maybe five things at a time. So my, uh, some of my research has been involved in looking at how much information can be sent to the brain. But I think my, the favorite research that I've done and uh, what I've been concentrating on recently is not so much about how, in, how much information is sent from the eye to the brain, but exactly how the brain is wired up to make sense of this information. Really, you know, what is the wiring diagram of the computer that we can call our brain? What is the wiring diagram and how does it make the brain work? And it makes me think of our, our most recent uh, research, which really is an example of extreme information overload. Uh, in our most recent uh, research, we're trying to put together a, a wiring diagram of roughly a, just a millionth of, of, a, of a mouse brain. But the information we've collected is over 10 million multi-megabyte uh, pictures. And frankly, uh, my information load, my personal information overload, is making sense of these millions of images. That's fun. Um, I, I, do you think, I mean, we're talking about, about this contem overload as a contemporary thing, but so for instance, in the field of visual, if you're looking at just the visual information, are we exposed to more input now than we were maybe 20 years ago or 40 years ago? You know, that's an interesting question. In a very technical sense, I don't think we are exposed to more input. Uh, uh, I, one of the most information-rich things I can think of is if, if you look at a, a tree with full of leaves on a windy day, there are hundreds of thousands of little events that are being signaled to our brain. And all of that information has been sent to our brain for tens, hundreds of thousands of years. What's different, though, is not the information overload, but the attentional overload. We, we have uh, arbitrarily much information reaching our, our brains, but typically we're not, in the real world, not asked to attend to so much information. But as all of us know, sitting in front of a screen is not so much uh, a, whole much, a whole bunch of visual noise coming at us, it's a whole bunch of different programs and different media that are vying for our attention that the goal of so much of what's online is to capture your attention, so much so that we, we can't make sense of it. But it's really, it, it's, uh, it, it's not the information, it's, it's just the, um, the well-designed computer programs and uh, media that are geared towards capturing really our most precious resource. Our most precious resource is not time, as people uh, usually think. You know, our time. Uh, it's not time, but it's attention. attention. We can have all the time in the world for our children, but if we have a device in our hands, we're we're not paying attention to them. So, so the, then the question is, of course, that emerges from all this is how worried we should be. I think 
in the general populace, there is, a, there is a sense that there are other people who need to be worried about their smartphone use and about their work ethics. And, but me, I don't need to worry so much. Is this something that everybody needs to worry about? Christine? Absolutely. Sorry, Christine. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Christine. I think so, and what we find in our research is uh, very much what was, uh, Gary was talking about, that uh, those individuals who are overwhelmed by this integration or blurred boundaries between work and private life through this uh, use of new technology, for instance, having both their private and work cell phone in the same smartphone, they, they say that they live and, and sleep with their cell phone, so they they check their work emails, the last thing they do before they go to bed at night, during evenings, weekends, holidays. <clears throat> so they do a lot of mobile work, as we say, around the clock. And of course, that also leads to longer work hours per week, which, which is related to not being able to, to relax and leading to sleep problems and so forth. But uh, we see very clear strategies uh, according to what Gary said, that making very conscious choices and, and priorities uh, on how you use uh, these new devices and also uh, make uh, choices yourself on how accessible you're supposed to be. So we see this uh, <clears throat> people who uh, look at their cell phone all the time, whereas other people say that no. Uh, around the weekend, there's a firm boundary. The dinner with the family is sacred, and when they go home from work, they they don't log in and and just check their work emails for the sake of it. I think a lot of people feel that they don't have <coughs> a choice, though. And mm. and I mean, there's plenty of research that suggests that being constantly interrupted mm. makes mm. you very much less efficient. Mm. So so the longer work days are, are also a consequence of not just not being able to finish your work in even in the time that you yourself feel that it should be possible to perform it, mm. to perform it in. But that is mostly a sort of planning problem, and it's uncomfortable, but it's kind of my own fault, I feel. Is it also dangerous? Is it, what happens to us when we're exposed to this kind of stress? Eric? Yeah. <coughs> you mean the stress itself? The stress, does the stress affect, I mean, does it have physical consequences over time? Yes, it, it sure does. And I mean, the short term, I think our bodies are made to really, you know, appreciate stress for short events. We should be able to escape from dangerous situations. But the long-term stress is something completely different. When, when it's really dangerous to the brain and could lead to other diseases like depression. And the single neuron really <coughs> suffers from stress hormones. And it acquires changes to its ion channels. It, the properties of the cell is changed. And in fact, when we talk about working memory, working memory performance really declines with stress, which could be a negative circle where reduced working memory performance leads to more stress mm. because you cannot cope, you cannot filter. Now you said there are changes on the neuron level. One, one, level, one word that I've kept hearing when reading articles about this recently is neuroplasticity. Janet, could you explain what yeah. that means? Because neuroplasticity, I think, is often mentioned in a positive context, but it's also a danger or what, what, what is it? Yeah, I guess that uh, usually it's, uh, it's uh, uh, discussed in relation to learning and adaptation. And, and uh, I guess that our nervous systems is all the time remodeling itself and, and, and adjusting, self-organizing to different inputs yeah. and so on. But, but of course, it can also go wrong, I guess. Eric. Yeah, so I think on, you know, on the cell level, it seems very logical that the changes that stress uh, makes to the cell makes it less responsive, which could look like a protective mechanism. We need to cool down the brain, but then it leads to worse performance for the function. And uh, possibly reprioritization between areas in the brain as yes. a consequence. And well. when we use modeling, we can really study, as Jeanette was describing, we can start with ion channels, the cell, what properties do we get from the ion channels to the cell, and how can this affect or enable the system's function, supporting working memory, or when changing ion channels, maybe not supporting 
the the function. It is lucky, and I mean, well, it's also a consequence of of, each other, of, of the fact. But this incredible compound stress from everything that we're we're talking about emerges in parallels with neuroscience that are enabled by the same technologies and might actually ultimately sort of help us help ourselves. I want to, Gary, for instance, you've been at the Scientific American for decades, and during the last six years, you've focused in particular on advancements in the field of neuroscience. What do you view as the biggest breakthrough uh, in the last couple of years? Well, I think if uh, neuroscientists were taking a vote on uh, what in, uh, I would go beyond the last six years, um, in the last couple of decades, it would probably be functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging that um, uh, tracks changes in blood flow in the brain, but those are correlated with um, um, something that's going on. So um, you can see what happens when my mouth moves, when I pick up a cup, when I have an emotion. Um, there have been, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of uh, PhDs and doctorates that have been granted on the basis of using that technology. But um, to go toward the goal of really understanding the brain, a lot more is needed. And that's really where you're seeing now uh, a push both in Europe and the U.S. to get better tools that allow um, some understanding of what's going on in the circuits in the brain. We have a pretty good understanding uh, at the level of individual neurons, and we have uh, a pretty good understanding of uh, gross anatomy with uh, techniques like uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. But we need to know about whole networks and circuits that are um, active when, when we're doing something like talking now. Mention yes, Clay. Um, I, I think more generally, the past several decades, what we have achieved is not just human imaging, brain imaging, but imaging uh, at different scales and and very fine scales. Uh, for instance, in in mice, uh, in, in um, we're able to look at individual cells and sometimes individual connections between cells. And uh, uh, historically, uh, one was able to eavesdrop into a single cell among millions in, in the brain. Now we can actually watch the activity of a 100 or a 1,000 brain cells at once and do all sorts of uh, advanced anatomical imaging. So I, th I think the entire field of, of taking pictures of the brain has really transformed it in the past 20 years. And that's actually what a, a good portion of the, the new brain initiatives are about, looking at the scale of individual neurons. Jeanette is, is, uh, is nodding, but I, I get a little worried. There's so much information. Is it, this has to be, I mean, of course, uh, as well as, as Clay just said before, that the, 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 the wealth of the information mm. makes the analysis very difficult. What you're trying to do with the Human Brain Project, putting all of it together, is this feasible? Yeah, so, so I, I would just like to add that another of these technical breakthroughs that, that uh, I think will drive neuroscience is really information technology and that we have these supercomputers and, and we have um, databases and we can, we can use this technology to mine all this data, uh, order it and create workflows and and build uh, quantitative brain models at different levels of description and really try to, to integrate uh, sort of more and more of the data with pieces that we already know. And, and sort of we can also do uh, in, 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 uh, in computer experiments with, with these models and so on. Uh, this is another field for big data, that big buzzword. Uh, yes, then. yes. Yeah. Uh, I, is the vision of the Human Brain Project making humans better, or is it being able to make machines that are more like that think more like us? Well, I think uh, the, the the basic uh, vision is is uh, uh, to understand the brain and even the human brain, and if we do that, of course, then we can better treat diseases, understand them and treat them, uh, and we can also, of course, uh, extract principles to use in in uh, 
uh, novel computing technologies. So, so there's also is, yeah sorry yeah. There's also something called the U.S. Brain Initiative. Uh, and how is that different from the Human Brain Project, Gary? The Human Brain Project, uh, we, we had an article in Scientific American on this uh, about a year ago by uh, Henry Markram, the um, very brilliant uh, researcher who's head of that project. It, it's really um, to lay the basis and ultimately to create a simulation of the entire brain from the level of single molecules all the way up to um, actual behaviors, the whole brain working. That is an incredibly ambitious project and there are, I, I would say, many neuroscientists who are skeptical as to whether we're even ready to do that or to begin doing that at this point. The um, Brain Initiative in the US is a more modest project. It's still highly ambitious. Uh, to develop a set of tools to uh, address some of the things I mentioned before, to be able to uh, record from and uh, try to understand uh, using some of the uh, information technology uh, that was mentioned before, uh, to try to w uh, understand what's going on in uh, individual circuits and networks in the brain. It's really focused on technologies that could be of general applicability and that ultimately may have some benefit in um, the clinics, uh, helping people uh, and he helping to uh, find uh, better diagnoses for disease and to understand the processes of say neurodegenerative diseases and then to find drugs. One of the questions that it might be interesting to bring up here with the other panelists, I'm not a neuroscientist, is that the level of complexity, particularly with the Human Brain Project, but also with the Brain Initiative in the U.S., is of such difficulty that it seems very unlikely that these problems will be addressed in the course of five or ten years that people are talking about. Of course, there has to be a tractable um, scheme for funding them, and you're not going to fund a project for a hundred years, but you could conceivably uh, think about doing this for a hundred or several hundred years and still be working on this. So I, I'm just interested what this have to say about that. That's yeah. true, that, um, but what I think, you know, one can worry that it'll take uh, effectively forever to understand the brain, but it's an extraordinarily exciting time we're living in. I, I've been in the field for 30 years, and in the past five years, uh, the optimism has, and, and the well-founded optimism has really just expanded. And I, I think the, the various brain initiatives uh, are feeding into this excitement and, and the ability to study the brain almost on its own terms at a level of complexity and, and data complexity that uh, gives the brain a run for its money. But and I, I think it's important to emphasize that there are multiple brain initiatives going on. Mm -hmm. I, I want to spend just one minute uh, describing our initiative at the Allen Institute. Uh, the Allen Institute was founded a decade ago by Paul Allen, one of the founders of Microsoft. And uh, yesterday, the uh, or the day before, uh, the goals of, of the American Brain Initiative came out. And what's actually quite exciting is the similarity between the goals of uh, the public endeavors, the, the Human Brain Project, the uh, American Brain Initiative, and, and private endeavors that actually are of the same order of magnitude, you know, tens of millions of dollars per year. And the vision is not really to do everything at once, but, but it, it's a very um, concerted, bottom-up approach, starting at the building block of brains, a, uh, brain cells and different different types of cells, and really uh, the components that go into the computer that yeah. is the brain, and building up our understanding of those uh, sequentially with all the new techniques. So I, I really see it as something that's 
quite exciting that, that the goals are, are well uh, enumerated and all of the brain initiatives really should achieve synergy. And I think inevitably, of course, if results are being published uh, continuously, as you must for funding, uh, then of course they will, there will be synergies as well. But I'm also, I have to say, I didn't quite understand what the goal meant until Gary translated it for me. If you are, if, actually, Christine, this is a question for you. If the Human Brain Project manages to create a digital simulation of a human brain, uh, that you would be able to run human experiences on, like computer programs, I guess. Would that be a human brain if you didn't also have a human body to put it in and a social network? Do you, do, does that, for you as a psychologist, <coughs> do you think you could go and, and do anything with that? Uh, I have no idea, as I'm not a neuroscientist, of course. But um, what we know in psychology and, and stress psychology that is really vital to people's experiences of stress is there the psychological um, interpretation of a situation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I don't know how to uh, model that into to these kinds of program, each individual psychological interpretation of, of a specific situation and if, if that is a threat or not and thus is it stressful and for how long and can I cope with it? Do I have the capacity capabilities to cope with this, to handle the situation. So, and that's vital for how we react f physiologically. So, Jeanette, if, if, you, if you would reach this goal, uh, let's say you would do it pretty fast, in like 20 years, because it would be very exciting if we did. Uh, and, and we had this simulated uh, human brain. Could, could that explain to us how shame works, for instance? Those kinds of things. <laughs> oh, that's that's a difficult uh, question. Well, f first of all, I I would like to sort of uh, so Gary said that the goal is to sort of simulate the whole brain from molecules to to the whole brain. But actually, um, the Human Brain Project is actually to create the infrastructure for actually doing this. And even though it's like 80 or more than 80 universities involved that start up. It's no way that those universities can actually do these things and put in all the parameters so that we have this full brain simulated in 10 years. But the goal is really to build the infrastructure for, for that this is actually possible, like this exascale uh, level of, of uh, simulation. So, Still, so it does I make the human genome project look <laughs> easy by comparison. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So w when it comes to your, your question whether you could uh, simulate shame, I think it sort of boils down to w what is this neural correlate to shame? Can you can uh, experimentalists say wh what what parts of the brain are active and how does the electrical activity look there? And then hopefully, uh, since in the in the Human Brain Project the idea is to build this. Uh, 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 quantitative brain models at different levels of details, then maybe one can can sort of try to understand what is it on the cellular level, for instance, that can create this, this kind of correlates at the higher level and and so on. Mm. So I think that is, uh, yeah. So, it, so it, actually, it, uh, yes, kind of is the answer, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was just thinking when you asked about shame that maybe I think not too far in the future we might be able to get something which acts intelligent. So Christine could Skype not knowing if it's a person or a machine and get a pretty good impression that this is an intelligent agent. But I think it will take much more time to really have that agent if it's a machine to get the bad feeling in the stomach that mm -hmm. shame gives me this mm. not nice feeling. Because what's very important also when we're talking about various emotions and what, what elicits emotions and, and stress reactions is uh, our values. Because we don't react with stress feeling threatened if it's not against something that we value and there we're different. So how do you translate uh, individual values, emotionally um, v labeled values to, 
different situations in, into to a machine. I mean, I think it's very, very far um, ahead. That's right. So you can't really have priorities, I guess, without values. No. Yeah. No. So that's that's why different people react differently in the same situation, and and some become stressed, others don't care because it doesn't isn't important to them, whereas others get excited and challenged, and so and and when we get that really, perhaps very fun fundamental about what it means to be human, mm. uh, our values and 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 how we perceive and in. in tr interpret situations. I'd like to let the audience in now. Uh, how do you, maybe you already, already, already all have information <laughs> overload, but I'm sure you also have questions. Do you have questions? You mull that over. Let's get a question from Skype instead. Yes? Do we? Nope. We just lost the connection there. OK, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do one while you think. Uh, diseases of the brain are responsible for one third of the total cost for healthcare in Europe. Uh, we can assume that, that uh, numbers are similar elsewhere or then that the diseases are, are not getting treated. So all of this research is incredibly important from that perspective, all of this medical stuff, that, because we are often uh, treating the symptoms because we don't know how any of this works. I, I wonder, though, what is the role of, of prevention versus building a perhaps 100-year-long 100, 100 project? Which is more important, or, or can these go hand in hand? I think and hope it will go hand in hand, because both mm. are, of course, very important. The, the, the one thing is about preventing things from happening that we already know causes. Mm. And the other thing is, of course, that we all always need new knowledge. To, to do that better. So, so it's not the one or the other, I think. Gary? I think you're already starting to see, to see this. Uh, in Sweden, for instance, which is a leader in this area, uh, the tools that we have, which, as we've just talked about, are in many ways inadequate and we need better tools, but the ability to use uh, MRI and some other techniques like uh, positive uh, positron emission tomography uh, to see the, uh, what's happening with the metabolism of brain cells and to do spinal taps to see um, whether there are aberrant proteins and things inside the cerebral sp spinal fluid. Those are all the basis for preventive screening of Alzheimer's. Now, the uh, notion there is that if you can look at people's uh, biomarkers, uh, the things that I just mentioned, say 10 years before a disease uh, breaks out in somebody who's at particular risk, or ultimately maybe for everybody at the age of 50, uh, in the same way as you might get a colonoscopy, you'll get these other measures, you may be able to prevent or um, you know, ward off uh, a disease like Alzheimer's or some of the other terrible diseases like Parkinson. Yeah, I think now we have a question uh, from Skype. Do we? Hello, Hampus. <laughs> Hello, Johanna. What is your question, and where are you? Uh, I'm on uh, on Gotland right now, and uh, first, thank you for having me on the show. Now, my question is not really related to information overload, but rather to relationship overload. Okay. Uh, and I've done, I've done some extensive research on the Swedish tw Twitter sphere, uh, basically download, downloading every single Swedish-speaking account and all their relationships. And that's some 500,000 accounts. And then I plotted them on a huge graph and done statistical and network analysis on this data set. Very well. And, and one of my key findings is that there is a very, very strong clustering. Now, culture, sports, politics, media, naturalists, uh, all cluster very strongly. So the overlap between these different clusters are relatively small. A person is foremost part of his or her own group with very few connections outside. Uh, in reality, that means that my Twitter feed or my Facebook feed or my any feed basically is totally different from that feed of another person sure. uh, that is, let's say, interested in sports. So what's your question? Uh, so now my question, uh, 
uh, we've discussed earlier, or you discussed uh, whether or not there are, um, we're processing more information than before. And I want to take that further into our social behaviors. Uh, and do you think that the information technology in general and the social web in particular has made the world a smaller place? Or are we just transferring our old offline behaviors into a new digital uh, world or new digital arenas? Okay. And I, I think in that, to put this in, this in the context also of the overload, of course, one of the behaviors that we immediately intuitively grasp uh, when we start feeling the pressure of all of this, this input flow and this attention demands is to become very selective. And we do tend to select on principles that are that we brought with us from from the world we grew up in, where all of this was not necessarily in place yet. Um, does okay? Does anyone have an immediate response? Gary would be the most obvious uh, for this. Well, I I think I uh, alluded to this before. The, the issue of information overload to me is somewhat of a misnomer. I think this is a tremendous blessing, you know, that, that uh, we may not be able to parse and understand all of this information immediately, but we have new tools. I think everybody has probably heard of the cliched big data to do this. And this is a an unbelievably great time in the world in which really everybody on the planet is able to share in this. Every, uh, there, there's no place really on the planet, including in Antarctica, where you can't get access to the PubMed database that includes all of the medical and uh, scientific research. So to me, information overload is not really that much of a problem. And the issue of maxing out working memory is something that has always been around. I think other people have mentioned that. If you go to Shakespeare or Euripides or anything, people have always been overwhelmed emotionally and by certain information that's directly before them. So I don't think that has changed that much. And on the other hand, we just have just an enormous amount of things that will keep people working and researching things for hundreds of years to come. Let me ask it this, this way. Do you think that our brains, for, because of neuroplasticity, for instance, do you think our brains will adapt to, all of, to this kind of communicate, communication and make it possible for us perhaps to connect with more people and not just recreate our real-world real social structures, as Sampas was describing? Uh, maybe a little bit. I mean, we have this sort of famous Flynn effect that the IQ is I increasing a little bit every generation, but probably it's saturating. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, yeah, yes, of course, and, and maybe it's, um, it will take some time until we, we learn how to, how to use a technology or, or, for instance, to set our limits. Or I think it's very much about setting limits. So it's not that you never should be out on the net or, or choosing to go back to the Stone Age. That's not possible. It's more like uh, being aware and conscious about your choices and not being perhaps um, updated or uploaded or whatever all the time. It's just that taking your, making your own choices when to, to connect and, and interact and when to just unwind and relax and switch off. Mm. So it's more, more that than, than not being able to handle information overload. So also letting go of the social pressures, I guess. Mm. Thank you yeah. for your question, Hampus. Do we have a question from the room? Overcome, perhaps, by shyness or your general brilliance? I do have one question. Yes, Eric. Uh, yeah, <coughs> I was thinking what you were saying, Christine, about getting time and maybe time to relax or, mm. you know, because I really think the brain is made just as I mentioned, we can tolerate stress for short times. I think it, the brain is also made to be active and be mm. uh, more relaxing, mm. just as the body needs to mm. recover from heavy exercise. Mm. The brain really is made to be active, but then to go into a less mm. active state. Mm. And we might think this is a kind of wasteful state because it seems like we're not doing anything. But in fact, 
it's a very active state where probably memory consolidation, so transferring um, information into memory takes place. So I think that's part of the problem that when we just max out our active states with our uh, information technology equipment, because we can, we can be present and active all the time, mm -hmm. we just remove from the brain one part of the processing mm -hmm. and it cannot really work. I, I would, that was exactly what I was going to ask, that what we should, if, if, if you have with all your scientific knowledge any practical advice for for how, how we should, what we should take with us from this conversation into all of our daily lives. So this would be one answer, that we do need periods of, of rest yes, for the yes. brain to function. Christine? Yeah, I, yeah. No, I think I, less I is more. That, that's exactly, less is more, not more. So it's really, uh, what's it about that, that you should do nothing or whatever, but do something different, do, do different things or just uh, be inactive because the, we, we talk about um, um, passive uh, activity where, where you don't do anything and that's when the body and the immune system also is working and, and yes. filling up your resources. So if you don't do that, if you're doing things constantly and mentally uh, are on the go all the time, you don't get that rest and recovery that's really needed for your brain, for your immune system. And that makes the vicious circle even, mm. even worse. Mm. That's really interesting. Now, we're, yeah, Clay. Yeah, if there's one thing we know from psychology and neuroscience is we aren't going to get much better at multitasking and keeping many things in our head at once. There are sort of hard limits that we just can't overcome. So again, I, I, I agree with everyone who's been saying that one really has to fight against the machine, <laughs> fight against uh, the very sophisticated computer programs and, and uh, media or platforms such as Facebook that have scientists trying to grab our attention, we have to unplug and realize that our best interactions, our best thinking, our best uh, driving, for instance, rather than texting and driving, driving has to be done without the uh, distractions that are to our online life. But what about all of you? Do you practice what you preach? I mean, you know... <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no? You, you text and drive, almost, no? no I don't text and drive. <laughs> but, but what about you? Do you Christine, do you find it... Do, do you, are you good at drawing boundaries between... Yes, I find it very easy to say no, and that's exactly a question that we have in our project. I find it easy to say no and set limits, and that's correlated with almost everything and how you relate and how what outcomes you have in stress and health, so yes. And it's very easy to say, just say no. <laughs> just say no, what about Eric? Uh, no, <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> I mean, I, I try, but I don't think I succeed. Uh, and I was thinking we had a meeting in Stockholm. We have a, the Stockholm Brain Institute, which is a collaboration of 10 different institutions. And we had a meeting with the theme cognitive aging. And they were discussing, you know, what kind of uh, therapies could we offer to, to uh, uh, um, counteract aging processes. But really, you know, we, we, we today can do very little, except for one thing. We know one treatment that really works, which is exercise. Mm. Uh, uh, so, you know, but do we really exercise even though we know we should? No. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is where we end crosstalks today. We at least got this very solid piece of advice. Before saying goodbye, just a reminder that our studio guests will now go backstage to chat with you online if you have more questions. Crosstalks will be back on December 4th with three new huge topics. Until then, be safe and be brave.